Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash a fork in time and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening right away. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash a fork in time. Welcome back to A Fork in Time, the Alternate History Podcast. Today we're exploring the interesting narrative of an alternative with Aaron Burr. And as we work through this uh, with co-host today, Brent Frost. Brent, we've got Aaron Burr now to the point that he has made Mexico independent from Spain, choosing a very efficient date that will be recognized to all of us. That's July 4th of 1806. So now we have an independent Mexico uh, that Burr has helped to uh, create as a result of his invasion and his effectiveness with uh, military prowess leading this expedition down. So what happens after that? Well, now you have an interesting situation because events outside of Burr's control will overtake him at this point. The uh, the British and the Austrians have come to peace with, uh, come to terms with Napoleon in Europe. After the battles of Trafalgar and Austerlitz, both sides realize that they are they're unbeatable on their strong areas. In their strong areas, it's been it's been said that it's like an elephant and a whale. They're masters of their own domains, but they cannot fight each other. The British were the whale. They were uncontested on the seas, yet they could not beat Napoleon on land. And Napoleon was unbeatable on land. His Grand Armée had won a crushing victory at the Battle of Austerlitz, but they could not break England. Could not bring England to heel because the English dominated the seas. So there was a finally a, a, a truce, a treaty was signed. And what this how this affects the uh, Anglo-American field uh, is because the British have been supporting the Americans during their war against Spain in the New World. They have been provide they have been uh, waylaying Spanish ships. They have provided escort uh, to American merchantmen whenever they happen to meet each other on the high seas and traveling in the same direction. They would pro- provide protection uh, very much in, more, in a co-belligerent, uh, you know, acquainted style relationship. Americans were none too eager to become allies of the British at this point. However, um, a mutual enemy sort of brought them together. And as a result, the, when the British decide to make peace with Napoleon, they stop their support of America and, in fact, sort of lean on America to agree to make peace with Spain. Now, a lot of people, including Hamilton and Burr, and this, this is actually seen as the beginning of the, of, the, uh, of the healing in their relationship. They had never been uh, you know, friends really much at any point, you know, more than friendly acquaintances, but they had become fairly strong political enemies during the 1790s. But this is seen as the beginning of a, re- of a new, renewed you know, French, if not friendship, uh, uh, friendly acquaintance, you might say, between them, because they both wanted to go on and conquer Panama, and they wanted to conquer uh, the, uh, the Colombia and support the growing independence movement that was flourishing in South America, and they wanted to see all of South America eventually become American. But the British, who were allied with Portugal, definitely did not want to see uh, Brazil, which was a Portuguese colony lost. And they didn't want to see the upstart Americans gain it. So Jefferson, who wanted to make peace, agreed through his ministers and representatives in Europe to sign a treaty with Spain. And Spain agreed to cede all of New Spain to the United States, which is all of the is all the territory of Central America, uh, all the way to Panama. They kept that little isthmus of Panama, but everything north of that would become a part of the United States or an independent uh, state of Mexico, an independent nation of Mexico. And the Americans also agreed to pay $3 million, which is a fire, you know, fire sale price, 
for California, which they had already partially conquered under Lewis and Clark. So this was a great deal for America. But Burr saw this as a bit of a letdown because he envisioned taking all of the Caribbean uh, coastline from Col Great Grand Colombia and Guiana on the northern coast of South America and also eventually taking Cuba from Spain as well. Cuba was, an ex was the pearl of the Caribbean empire of Spain. It was far more valuable in many ways than Mexico. So in order to preserve Cuba, Spain basically agreed to write off the, uh, the empire, the uh, kingdom of New Spain, the vice royalty of New Spain. But both Burr and Hamilton were not pleased by this arrangement and it caused them to become occasional political allies as a result. But moving on real quickly, because we only got a few, I know we only got a few minutes left. In, you got to remember that Spain at this point ha, is a a very a very uh, centralized and non-democratic monarchy, and the Catholic Church is very strong. It's very conservative, and so the the new Spain now becoming Mexico, they are it, they're not quite sure which way to go. The one obvious route would be to emulate the United States and form a republic, a federal republic. The problem is that the Catholic Church is hostile to that particular idea. You know, historically, the Catholic Church is more in support of monarchies than republics, particularly since the French Republic had done horrible, committed horrible atrocities against the church. So naturally, they're hostile to liberal ideas and to republics. So eventually, a compromise is reached. And they basically decide to form a monarchy, a limited monarchy on the British model, a constitutional monarchy. But they can't decide who's going to be their king because Spain has gone around Europe convincing any potential royal house not to send a prince to rule over them. So they decide to make Burr the region of, Spe of, Me of Mexico. And they're not sure if they want to call it a kingdom or an empire. They eventually will settle on empire. And the Empire of Mexico, which will stretch from the Rio Grande all the way down to Panama, and all the areas north of there will be sold to the United States. And eventually the United States, later in some years down the road, will purchase, because the new the Mexico needs the money, they will purchase Sonora, uh, what, what, be, what is the territories of Sonora and Chihuahua and Baja California. But at this point, Burr is trying to basically build a country, if not from scratch, pretty darn close to it, keeping in mind that he has to deal with the newly uh, enfranchised peasants. E even though they can't all vote, they still have a voice in politics now. He has to deal with the church. He has to deal with the great landowners. So he's in a very difficult situation. And over the next four years, he will basically be building a country not quite from scratch, but pretty darn close to it. Meanwhile, in 1808, Jefferson decides, in a bit of a surprise, not to run for re-election. Uh, and it's the, his reasons for doing so were a combination of he having been a wartime president, was very much uh, t physically exhausted, and also he was 65 years old at this point, and his, vice, his uh, chosen successor, not vice president, but chosen successor, Secretary of State James Madison, was 57. And so to give Madison a chance to become president and have two terms in office, he wanted to uh, he wanted to make sure that that was possible. So he stepped aside and he was never a big enthusiast for a multi term presidency to begin with. And Jefferson's example of stepping down after one term will also be seen as a precedent that a lot of people in the Republican side will look back to. But Jeff, for all of Jefferson's uh, for all of Jefferson's uh, planning for, for Madison, it was sadly not to be for poor for poor James Madison, the father of our Constitution. Uh, the brass ring of the presidency was to elude him in 1808 because a combination of Burrites and other forces who thought that Virginia had too much power in the federal government, that they were trying to build a dynasty, got together and narrowly defeated Madison. And, and uh, Secretary of State Robert Livingston was nominated for president by making a deal with the with with some of the rivals to Madison within Virginia, the Virginia delegation to Congress. You know, back in those days, the the congressmen, senators and congressmen of the Republican Party would meet in a caucus to nominate the candidate for president and vice president. And some of the rival Virginians supported Livingston in exchange for their favorite son, James Monroe, being nominated for vice president. It was it was really funny because Madison was running in the in the not for nomination with George Clinton as his promised running mate of New York, 
Virginia, New York versus New York, Virginia. You had these two competing slates, and it was really close. It was only three votes that separated them in the final vote. And this, this contention, this, this very close race, would eventually lead to the election of Light Horse Harry Lee as president of, of the Federalist Party. Uh, many people would have been surprised at that time if you had predicted that having just won a war, having added over the last eight years, having taken America from a, from a small country on the eastern seaboard of North America to having conquered, uh, having added territory all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And since Mexico is a satellite and ally of the United States, is practically part of America. So under the Burr-Jefferson administration, the United States has gone from a power east of the Mississippi to owning all the land south of Canada, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Down. Uh, either owning or having protectorate control over all the land down to Panama. You would think that such a success would result in a landslide victory, but the, a small, you know, small uh, fate of history conspired against that because the state of Virginia, which elected their electors to the Electoral College by popular vote, winner take all, they had a split ticket. Some just some disgruntled uh, Jefferson, uh, Jeffersonian and Madisonian Republicans who didn't like that Livingston had snatched the nomination away from them, they ran at their own slate of electors in Virginia. And you got to remember that Light Horse Harry Lee, hero of the Spanish-American War and the Revolution, is a Virginian. Right. So he is able to win. He's able to win a plurality of the popular vote in Virginia, not a majority, but because of this split federal, Republican vote, the Federalists are able to slip in and win Virginia's 24 electoral votes, all of them, not not half, not a third. They're able to win all of those key 24 electoral votes. And as a result, Lee just bar just barely slides through and becomes president and with his vice president, uh, Rufus King of New York. So, again, it's one of those Virginia versus New York, a Virginia candidate for president and a vice president for New York versus the Republican candidate Livingston of New York and vice president Monroe of Virginia. But uh, this gave new life to the Federalist Party and Alexander Hamilton himself, having served with distinction during the war, uh, be, is, gets a new lease on life politically. Although he is not appointed to any cabinet post, he is seen as the power behind the throne and certainly far more powerful in terms of the Federalist Party leadership than, than the new president who, appoint, who goes on to appoint John Quincy Adams, a senator from Massachusetts, as his secretary of state and General Pinckney, of the, who served in the revolution and run for president in 1804 as the secretary of war, amongst other distinguished federalists. But this is this is a significant change from uh, from our I'll just pause here. A significant change, of course, from what really happened in history, because after 1800, the federalists never got back into power and continued to shrink in influence, although they had a few bright spots in 1808 when they ran a decent campaign, but still lost. And in 1812, when they almost won, just a few thousand votes in a few states separated uh, Dwight Clinton in 1812 with his uh, fusion campaign of Federalists and Republicans from defeating James Madison. But, of course, in real life, the Federalists never got back into power, never took control of either House of Congress after 1800 and continued to uh, fade until irrelevancy until ultimately they were ruined by being perceived as the anti-war party after the War of 1812. But in this timeline, of course. They were supporters of the Me of the Spanish American War, and so they reaped the benefits. I, I see this scenario much like the Mexican American War, in that the Whig Party ran a successful general, and even though the Whigs were the minority party in the United States, a successful general coupled with a split ticket on the Democrat side. Remember, in 1848, Lewis Cass is the Democrat nominee, but Martin Van Buren, the former Democrat president, runs on the Free Soil ticket and takes just enough votes away in the key state of New York to ensure that the that the Whigs win the presidency and uh, and Zachary Taylor becomes president. So I see a similar scenario here. And the success of, of Light Horse Harry Lee will also dramatically affect the career of his son, uh, Robert E. Lee, to the extent that um, Robert E. Lee's lifelong dedication to a high personal standard and character is in many ways a reaction to his father's rakish and irresponsible life and an ignominious end where he dies bankrupt, in exile, uh, away from his family. That causes Lee to have a very strong sense of personal honor and saving face and never letting people see you in any way that would other than a very honorable and Christian manner. 
and uh, that will uh, Lee's life will definitely be affected by the fact that as a young boy now, his father, he's four years, he's, oh my goodness, he wasn't even four years old. He was just born. He was just born when his father was running for president and becoming president. So as a child, you know, he won't have very many memories of it, but his father is president of the United States uh, during the time that he's a very young boy growing up. Uh, he's two years old when his father becomes president, but this will have a dramatic effect on his life trajectory as well. And so and so this is where history kind of our narrative kind of comes to an end for uh, most of America in the sense that we sort of bend back in to the main flow of history because the Federalists, they've had their a good year in 1808, but the, the forces of history are still against them in 1810. The, there's still a desire to annex Canada. A lot of northern Republicans say, look, you southerners, you got Mexico, you got the southwest. Now it's our turn. We want Canada. And the Manifest Destiny uh, you know, advocates, you know, Hamilton and his faction are saying, we want to add all of North America. We've got Mexico. Now let's go for Canada. And no one is, is big fans of the British at this point after they've blocked America from pursuing more, more gains and conquests in 1807. So, and the British also continued their impressment policy after stopping it during the Spanish-American War, they've restarted it. And so there is a definite uh, yearning on the war hawks who just won big majorities in 1810 to go to Congress and to, uh, to declare war on, on Britain. But Lee uh, opposes this and, ha and Hamilton uh, he is he has a bit of a split with Lee over this. And as a result, in 1812, the Warhawk candidate, James Monroe, is elected president with Daniel Tompkins as his running mate and narrowly defeating President Lee, much like James, uh, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson and Aaron Burr's coalition in 1800 defeated John Adams, who had a break with Alexander Hamilton before. Although in this case, Hamilton was more. Hamilton, uh, the break wasn't as bad with President Lee because Lee was at least willing to consider a war with England, but he just didn't think the timing was right. And and a couple of electoral, just a little electoral twist in a couple of states, much like the, the Burr campaign in 1800 in New York State, just caused the election to turn on a couple of little things. As most presidential elections do, a couple of little twists of history, which could have easily gone the other way, result in James Monroe becoming president in 1812. But unlike our timeline, he will inherit a much stronger Navy, a much stronger army with military experience in Mexico, which will serve them a lot better during the War of 1812. And uh, going forward, this will be a definite uh, this will be a definite advantage to the United States. Uh, but I'll just close by giving an epilogue as to uh, these, uh, what happens to Aaron Burr. By 1811, uh, he's decided that they can't find a king for Mexico. Uh, for the Mexican Empire in Europe. He's been content at this point and has told his friends that he thinks that Mexico will eventually become a republic, much like the United States, but that he's just not ready for it. And when his friends accuse him of having royal aspirations, he, he always says that he has no aspirations in that regard. He's just, he's just a custodian of Mexico, a keeper until they can find somebody. And his ambition has always been and his letters to his daughter, to whom he's very much attached, attest to, attest to this before she joined him in Mexico, that he didn't, his aspiration was not to be king of Mexico or emperor of Mexico. He wanted to be the power behind the throne. He wanted to be the prime minister, the, the Pitts, the William Pitt the Younger of, Mex of the Mexican empire and have a, you know, a, 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 a puppet king to be the head of state. But when they couldn't find a king, Burr now had to figure out whether or not he wanted to appoint a king or just take the role on himself. And ultimately, when the various competing factions in Mexico couldn't agree on who they would want to be emperor, they decided to make him emperor. So in 1811, the Spanish uh, parliament and confirmed by a national referendum, uh, the Spanish Congress and the a national referendum elects Burr because emperors are elected. Kings inherit their monarchy like a title to land, but emperors are elected. The, uh, the uh, Congress and the people of Mexico elect Aaron Burr as Emperor Juan Augustin I, and he chose the name Juan, which of course is the Spanish for John, in honor of his, uh, his grandfather, Jonathan Edwards, the great uh, Puritan preacher, even though 
uh, even though he was not, Burr was not himself a believer in any sense uh, that his grandfather would recognize. I think Burr's sense of humor was such that he liked the idea of a, of a Catholic emperor of Mexico taking the name from one of the most uh, uh, um, hard shell, fire and brimstone Protestants who, you know, uh, Jonathan Edwards viewed the Catholic Church and the Pope as Antichrist. And I think that was sort of Aaron Burr's little joke. And historians uh, tend to agree with that sentiment. That was just his little joke uh, on uh, on his subjects. And they didn't even know it because Burr, being the consummate politician, officially converted to Catholicism in order to become emperor of Mexico. But there's no evidence that this was anything but a public political gesture. Um, although he eventually did have to settle down and marry, he was at this point, he's in his late 50s and has never, uh, he's only been married once. His wife died shortly after their marriage, leaving him only one daughter. So eventually he will marry the uh, the heir to one of the great families of Mexico, their, their only daughter, and will inherit a lot of money and become, and he will have several children uh, by her. But uh, his daughter will become his his designated successor until a son is born to him. And he will become a very successful emperor in Mexico, ruling it in a combination of Napoleonic authoritarianism and democratic reforms. And his the next 20 years of his reign are dedicated to basically trying to modernize Mexico. Mexico is a backward version of Spain. And Spain, of course, was even was the most backward country in Europe at that point in the early 1800s. So. He, they're even worse off in many ways. They have a lot of potential, but he he spends the next 20 years importing a lot of immigrants from Europe, a lot of Irish, a lot of German uh, immigrants to build up the nation's human capital, to bring in industrious people who will farm the land and make better uses of it. He, he gets a lot of money. He gets money from Amer the United States by selling them relatively unpopulated and uh, worthless land up in Sonora and, and uh Chihuahua and, uh, and Baja California, and also the Indians up there are no are no pleasant thing either. So he gets that off his chest. But he maintains the Central American provinces of Nicaragua and Guatemala and Honduras and all the way down to Panama, and he will make a very successful empire out of this. And this will be his reign will be compared favorably to the reign of Emperor Pedro II of Brazil, who will. Become also rule for a very long time and be a, seen as a very enlightened and uh, modernizing emperor. And in many ways, Pedro will draw inspiration from Emperor Juan Augustine, which is Burr's royal title, of course, and building his own empire and liberalizing the, uh, the government. Because one of the things Burr does, significant things, is Burr abolishes, not only do they give rights to the peasants, but Burr abolishes slavery. And this causes a break with a lot of southern Southerners back home in the United States who see Mexico as an ally and a, hopefully a, a future candidate for annexation. After Burr abolishes slavery, there's a definite opposition to annexation. A lot of Americans had opposed annexation because they didn't want to bring six million Creoles and you know and uh, you know half Indian, half. Uh, Spanish people into the Republic. There's definitely a, a racial prejudice there, but also they don't want to bring in six million Catholics. But when Mexico becomes a non-slave holding region, the South immediately pulls back from wanting to annex Mexico. And that's where Burr makes the deal to sell part of Northern Mexico uh, to the United States. He keeps the Rio Grande provinces because they're more rich in, in uh, potential. Uh, but he sells most of the rest of the land of northern Mexico to the United States. But after that, there's never really any serious talk of annexing Mexico to the U.S. after they become a, a non-slaveholding empire. And uh, Burr will be seen. This is one of the things that has caused a lot of people to write favorably of Burr is his first step in ending slavery in North America, the first major nation to end slavery after Haiti uh, in the Western Hemisphere was Mexico. And uh, William uh, um, Wilberforce will write many letters of appreciation and admiration to Emperor Burr through the years, and they will continue a correspondence until their deaths in the er, in the 1830s. Uh, which is the which brings us to an end because the funniest part about all this is that Aaron, one of Aaron Burr's clo closest uh, correspondents in old, in his declining years, 
is Alexander Hamilton, his great rival from New York politics in the 18, early 1800s and 1790s, because in trying to build this new nation, Burr looks for economic advice to his old time rival, Alexander Hamilton. And although Hamilton will never, never travels to Mexico personally, they will uh, exchange many letters and their correspondence has is com is com been compared to that of Jefferson and Adams, who, of course, famously died on the same, same day in day. 1826. Hamilton actually outlives Burr by several years and even wrote a biography of him, which was considered one of the standard American, probably the standard American biography on on Alex, excuse me, on, on Aaron Burr until the late 18, uh, late 1800s. But for about 50 years, it was the standard biography of Burr and Burr's, Burr's opponents throughout history, throughout the 19th century, compared him to Napoleon and saw him as a very ambitious man who wanted to carve himself out of kingdom. But even his opponents had to agree that he gave the United States Louisiana, he gave the United States California, and he set them on a course for many other territorial acquisitions in the future. And he also was probably the only man who had the will, the foresight, and the sheer drive to make Mexico a successful nation. And no other, no other leader could have done that. So he's, even his enemies had to admit that he was a, successful, a success in that regard. And of course, his fans to this day consider him an enlightened, uh, modernizing liberal ruler and a man of incredible foresight who built the modern, who made the modern map of the United States pretty much as we know it today and made a successful uh, nation out of Mexico, which to this day is one of the richest nations in, in the world, is a member of the G9 and has uh, been a very friendly ally to the United States. And given the turmoil that we've seen in several South American countries and African countries and the recent refugee crisis into Europe from Africa, it has been speculated by some alternate historians that had the United States not uh, brought Mexico into its sphere of influence and had not uh, uh, an American emperor been installed there and had not a lot more Europeans settled there early when they did, that Mexico would have become a third world country. And with its border on the United States, you would have probably seen millions of Mexican refugees and economic migrants moving into the American Southwest throughout the 18th, 19th and 20th century. And eventually that would have led to a great deal of, of, of strain and political back and forth because of the differences in the demographics and the religion of the American population versus these new incoming, uh, these new incoming Mexican uh, migrants. And so uh, history might have well turned it, but down a very different route with, a lot, with, with linguistic and racial and political balkanization. Uh, in fact, it's even been speculated that you might have seen a, a political candidate elected president on a very nationalistic and anti-immigration ticket uh, in reaction to that. So, oh no, that that that, ne that never could have happened, Brant. Well, now it, you're it, now it, you're just talking yeah. nonsense. Well, well, well it, it it is considered <laughs> it is considered a little a little far fetched, particularly since you know we have a since we have a a, a Latin American or at least a descendant of Latin American. Uh, president uh, in the White House right now, but, uh, pre and, you know, I think President Cruz is doing a relatively good job, but uh, his, uh, but I think that uh, his, his, it, during his time in the Senate, as a senator from Cuba and, uh, and president, I think he's done a good job, but it's, it's definitely, it definitely would have, it'd been a lot harder for a, uh, a, a, a president of, of Spanish ancestry or Cuban ancestry to have been elected president had we seen this, ma a massive inflow of of immigrants, illegal immigrants, causing tension between the Anglo population and the new wave. But uh, much as we saw the Irish, the hostility to the Irish before President Kennedy was elected. But anyway, I, I, I digress. <laughs> Brad, I, I appreciate the uh, first of all, I appreciate how uh, how um, how much in character you remain throughout that narrative. I got to the point where I was trying to remember in my head what is the real history versus what what Brad is suggesting here, because the uh, the alternate history, our counterfactual here, the way you've laid it out is very compelling. And, and, and just for me, the other thing that struck me, because you know, we, we talked about this last night preparing for recording today, and, and then, of course, you sent me the outline. But again, I, I think it would actually make a really good book and make an interesting thing to actually read and be fleshed out anymore. I'm not just saying that. Is for myself personally, being, being a Texan 
And so I'm familiar with a with a timeline here that overlaps some of the, again that I mentioned before the territory and sort of the history here. It's always amazing to me how these are big changes. Obviously, you know, having Aaron Burr end up as a uh, as a monarch in a, in a Mexican empire is is very different than the real timeline, of course. But thinking through how how even just small things about how things that are the same but yet are different come to be in your uh, in your alternative timeline, Texas ends up being part of the United States, but it does so in such a different way that it doesn't have a lot of what, and again, I'm speaking here as a native Texan, but also, of course, as an American, uh, Texas prides itself on the fact that it was an independent nation for nine years before it joined the United States. And that part of the persona of Texas as a, as a, as a region, as an entity, is this idea of, yeah, we, we didn't come to be a state like other states came to be a state. And under your timeline, there's a very different story to that. So you don't have... Um, a Texas revolution against Mexican authority. Uh, you have Texas as part of this, you know, this this grand exercise, expedition, um, endeavor uh, that Burr takes on, and it does it all sort of in one fell swoop. And that produces a you know a very different way that Texas thinks of itself moving forward. And does that make sense to you? Oh, absolutely, no question about it. There there is no there is no Alamo. There is no San Jacinto. Uh, for the uh, for the sake of and it's it's plausible that that uh, you know Houston and and uh, Stephen Austin and uh, and Davy Crockett would have been involved in the in the uh, Spanish American War I've outlined so and just for fun I've you know, included them but uh, but yes it would have been a very different different situation Texas would have been more like assuming that the state even became a state along the same geographic borders right. it, it did um it certainly would have become a state eventually might have been divided into more than one state but it would have been more it would have been more like florida or california in terms of its state identity than it would have been um than it would have been under under you know it would really happen uh, it certainly if it maintained if it maintained its size certainly or close to it you know, perhaps a part of the Panhandle becomes part of Oklahoma, or perhaps the area west of the Pecos becomes part of New Mexico. But, but if base, if the basic Texas remains intact and becomes a state, its sheer size will cause it to take a certain amount of of independent streak and identity. But it will be, but it will be an identity much more like California's or Florida's right. or New York City's rather than uh, what we know today. And you know, one thing I've I've wondered is, or one thing that I, that I wonder was, would would Burr would the United States have eventually annexed the Rio Grande, uh, the Rio Grande regions of northern Mexico? Because in, in real in the real life, Rio Grande uh, seceded from Mexico around the same time after the Texas won its independence. There was a rebellion along the Rio Grande, and they were they formed the Republic of the Rio Grande, but that republic was unsuccessful in. Uh, and was eventually reconquered uh, by Mexico. Part of me says that the United States would have taken that area, but that area had a relatively high population, something like, oh, I think 100, 150,000 people during the early 1800s. So I doubt that many people would have been easily annexed into the United States. Um, I mean, they could have certainly done it. But if you look at what the United States took from Mexico in 1847 and 1848, 1849, they took basically unpopulated areas. They took the Southwest, New Mexico, Nevada, Colorado, and California, and the whole population of that area might have been 50,000 max. So I see Mexico as selling the United States as Burr to get money to build, you know, to build his empire selling the, of the United States, Chihuahua and Sonora, which were largely unpopulated except for the Indians, and Baja and the Baja Peninsula, and keeping the Rio Grande uh, region, which was a lot more also agriculturally uh, fertile and had a higher density of, of population. Uh, but yeah, Texas is a definitely a different different place. And, you know, we, does Houston ever co go to Texas? You know, does is the city, does the, is the great city in Texas today, in Galveston Bay, is it named Galveston or Houston, or right. is it, or for that matter, is it named Bur is it named Burrsville? Right. Uh, you know, it, it probably would end up being called Galveston because there already was 
you know, the, uh, apart uh, separate from this, you know, this part of history, there was a Galveston port there a, a little uh, that uh, Jean Lafitte of New Orleans fame. And, and, and the, uh, you know, if anyone's seen the movie, the Buccaneer, they know the story of Jean Lafitte, the pirate who joined forces with Andrew Jackson, the war of 1812, he would eventually make uh, Galveston his base. So uh, we know, uh, so there certainly would have been a city there, but it probably wouldn't have been named for Houston because Houston might have settled in Texas after the Spanish American war, but just as likely since he was just a teenager during that war, he likely would have served as an officer and gained some, uh, some honor like he did under Jackson in the Indian wars. And then he would have gone back to Tennessee took, you know, took up politics and become governor of Tennessee one day, most likely, but, uh, but uh, probably, and may eventually ended up in Texas, but he certainly would not have ended up in Texas as the founder of, of, the, of the Republic and the George Washington of Texas. He would have just, he'd have ended his days as a landowner there in quiet obscurity, uh, known, you know, known just to history for having served in those wars and having once been governor of Tennessee. Right. And, uh, D- and Davy Crockett too, uh, he, would have his life would have followed followed a very similar trajectory except that he would have ended up in texas history would have remembered him for the books about you know the his his uh, autobiography the moot the uh some of the stories about him uh but i doubt he would have achieved the fame he had because crockett's life even though he had a very interesting life before the alamo the interest in Crockett is, uh, and the way, and his the way his life closed. Right. The Alamo is a key part of that, and without that, he is, you know, like the movie the Re- uh, the Revolent or the, the, the Arabian. I have to pronounce, I have to remember to pronounce it right. But you know, the movie about the Mountain Man starring Leonardo DiCaprio. Right. You can, I can see him Crockett achieving a fame, something like that. Eventually, a movie is probably made about him, but his fame is far, far smaller than in our time, than today. There's certainly no Davy Crockett craze in the 50s. Fess Parker never achieves international stardom by playing him in the movies and the TV show for Walt Disney. And, uh, and uh, Daniel Boone, if any, when people think of a frontiersman, they think of Daniel Boone. Davy Crockett is relatively unknown to most people in this world. And, and, if there might still be a Daniel, there might have been a Daniel Boone TV show, but the uh, the coonskin cap would have been the Daniel Boone coonskin cap. Right, and, and with, with, without without Crockett dying a a martyr's heroic, you yeah, know, lost exactly. cause death at the Alamo is 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 the as the as the end of his life, you know, that that sort of exclamation point that's put on his life, as you say, would have changed how people would have thought of him. Um, you know, for example, we we wouldn't have whatever. There's been three or four movies that have been made that, that are the Alamo. It, it just wouldn't exist. We, we I don't know what we as Texans what our rallying cry would be, but it wouldn't be remember the Alamo <laughs> because again, it never would have happened. And again, that that's just me bringing my personal perspective into this because of of where I was born and where I was raised. Just thinking about how you know history would have been the same in many ways. I still would it, being being born here. I would have been an American. Yeah, well, and but and, but, and, but but but, and but, but I've thought of being a Texan sure. quite the same way. Oh yes, oh yes. History would have also been, uh, his. You know, after a certain point, you have to close the narrative because too many differences. The, the differences, right. the butterfly effect is so strong. But uh, also, I think that history has a tendency to that we we have a tendency to overestimate the effect of one event to change history over too long a period. And we also tend to underestimate it. You know, there's the Marxist school of determinism, and there's also the great man school right. of history. And they both have certain aspects of truth to them. But uh, you got the determinist and the great man school. But uh, I also think that they that uh, they tend to sort of blend together. And so I, I envision the arc of history sort of closing in in some areas, particularly in the United States, after around 1812, because. If the United States goes to war with with Britain, either in 1812 or 1813, 1814, history is going to be fairly similar, I think, in that the you, the United States will still go with to war. If they have a better army, they can probably conquer Canada. But politically speaking, if the Federalists still oppose that war, and if the British still burn Washington and Jackson still wins the Battle of New Orleans, the Federalists are going to be decimated politically. And that, that would be a great subject for another discussion. 
would the Federalists support another war in 1812? Would, the, would they support a war on the theory that the South got Mexico, now we get Canada? And that would have a huge impact on, the, on history because after the Federalists collapsed, after the War of 1812, the American politics is defined by Jeffersonian, classical liberal, democratic republicanism. And not, it is not until, well, perhaps ever again, that a, Euro, a conservatism that a European could recognize ever flourishes in America again. You know, the, the, the Whigs and the Republican Party that will come along after the Federalists, they are certainly more conservative in a, to a certain degree in the, in the British sense than, uh, than the um, than the Fed, than the de, uh, Republican uh, Democratic Republicans and Democrats are. However, they're in no way can they be compared to the European conservatives. Basically, the kind of king, church, country, you know, hostility toward mass participatory, demo, participatory democracy that that dies with the Federalist Party. America basically becomes Jefferson's country after the War of 1812, after the collapse of the Federalist. The Republican Party of the 1850s has some Hamiltonian aspects to it, but they can never be the party, the never can, never will the Federalist platform be revived in any party in America because Federalists believed in rule by the, uh, you know, by the elite few, the meritorious elite few, you know, they weren't, they didn't believe in an aristocracy of birth, but they did believe that the common people were lot were liable to be led astray by demagogues and and politicians, dangerous politicians like Aaron Burr and Thomas Jefferson. And as a result, it, it's best that the, you know, the meritorious 10 and 20 percent of the population be the voters and make the decisions. And that was very much Hamilton's vision. But after the War of 1812 and the collapse of the Federalists, that vision died in America. And as a result, um, the Americas became two halves of Jeffersonianism. Jeffersonian individualism became the Republican and Libertarian uh, parties. Jeffersonian communitarianism became, and, and a personal you know, freedom and liberalism, uh, became the Democratic Party. And those two strains of Jeffersonian liberalism and whatever you want to call it define American politics even to this day. Right. The point that I was going to make was that um, part of, Part of what's also interesting to me when you think this through is that uh, the other impact that even carries down your alternate timeline carried down to today, we sort of talking about you know the issue of immigration, how it would have played out differently, uh, is that when you have a, a stronger economic, more modernized um, Mexico and then perhaps Central America and wherever that would have you know led to with this idea of uh, you know, the Mexico that comes to be in the 18-teens, um, under, under your alternative timeline, is, is that does have the butterfly effect, effect there gets very exaggerated moving forward in time. You know, for example, one of the things that ran through my head, and I don't even want to explore this because we could probably go on for another 20 minutes about it, but just think about it is, okay, they control that that area, that isthmus of Panama, right? <laughs> the, the great the great place to build a canal. So we may be talking about it's still may be called the Panama Canal. But imagine the Panama Canal is, is constructed by a uh, an industrialized Mexico. Mm -hmm. and what, you know, what what difference does that make? Uh, you talked uh, about the burgeoning independence movements and then anti-colonial movements that were going on in South America during the early part of the 19th century. Uh, could, would would that have had a different outcome? Again, whether it's you know sort of um, um, a, a, a U.S. you know. Uh, hegemony that you know over the entire Western Hemisphere. I don't know if that's ever achieved. Although it'd be interesting to think that through, but you would certainly have a different. You would have a different East versus West. Now I'm talking about the the hemispheres. Oh, yeah. uh, in, in in terms of how things would have moved forward, because you would have had not just the the growth of the United States as an economic power as we move through the Industrial Revolution and into the 19th century, but that would have been more widespread. And how that would have played out on world politics is a, is a whole other butterfly part that goes on here. But something that, that, that's noted, and you even mentioned, you sort of redirected, for example, the waves of immigration. There would have need to be been those waves of immigration. The things that caused uh, Germans, that caused um, uh, others to uh, the Irish uh, to move away from Europe and come to the United States, 
if they had direct been directed not to the United States but been directed to this this New Mexican Empire or other places, that would have also had an interesting sort of butterfly effect uh, moving out throughout history and you know it would just be different, whether it be better or worse today. We would be different. We'd be dealing with different problems today. We, not that we would not have no problems. We'd be just dealing with different ones. But they would be very different in terms of, I think, what this is not going too political here. The current thing, one of the, one of the biggest challenges we face in the Western Hemisphere today is economic imbalance and what that produces. And if you have more of a balanced set of economies in the Western Hemisphere, I think you have a very different scenario today than what we presently enjoy. Which, whichever side you think you're on, I hate to say what side you're on today, but whatever perspective sure. you take on our, our current politics today, particularly in the United States and in its relations with its with uh, those that are in in the same hemisphere in the same on the same continent, is it would have been very different if you had more. It would be very different if you had more of an economic balance throughout the entire hemisphere, because that's one of the things that doesn't exist today because of the the real way that things worked out in the real timeline. Absolutely, and I could see a very, uh, I could see a very plausible scenario whereby Mexico, the Mexican Empire under Burr, definitely get uh, takes Panama from the uh, from Gran Colombia as part of a deal to help them get their independence. And I see them getting their independence sooner rather than in the early 1820s. I see them getting their independence. Um, maybe ten, five or ten years earlier, and I could see a scenario whereby Mexico will annex Gran Colombia after Bolivar. Uh, you know, Bolivar was a successful general, but very unsuccessful in making a successful uh, nation out of Gran Colombia, and he eventually uh, he eventually gave up on it. But I could see a scenario whereby. Mexico would annex North the that area, and the only thing that would really stop them would be just the logistics of moving an army through Central America. They would probably need naval support. If the United States, if the British Navy didn't intervene to stop them, they could probably do it. But if the British decided to to uh, prevent them, uh, that would be difficult. But it could, it's very plausible that they could have taken Gran Colombia, and if they'd taken Gran Colombia, you know, why not Peru? Why not? Why not Chile and Argentina? I mean, San, San Martin, who San Martin, who was very successful at liberating Chile and uh, Argentina and Peru, when he met, well, not Peru, when he met, kind of halfway with the Bolivar, who had liberated Gran Colombia and parts of Peru, when they met together, uh, he bought, he agreed to hand over control of the revolutionary forces leadership to. To uh, Bolivar and to uh, and he left. I believe he went to Europe after that. Um, very much a, a Cincinnati's, you know, Washington s move. But if the, if Mexico had liberated northern uh, northern the northern parts of South America, it's very possible that a similar scenario plays out, whereby San Martin uh, hands over leadership to Emperor Burr or uh, Emperor Juan Augustine, as we call him, uh, or just becomes a general in his army. That Burr, Burr's master plan is to take all of South America, or certainly all of the Spanish-speaking South America, and to uh, and he he enlists and pays for the armies and subsidizes the armies of Bolivar and San Martin and many others, and all of South America outside of Brazil becomes part of the uh, the Empire of Mexico. Maybe that maybe they rename it, you know, the you know the American Empire or the Latin American Empire, whatever. But I think the United States would support such a move because it's a corollary to our world's Monroe Doctrine. Right. Uh, it would it would. And, you know, America, you know, Jefferson thought that eventually perhaps the United States would take all of, of the hemisphere. However, the idea of absorbing so many millions of Catholics to the America of the 1820s and 30s would be highly anathema. So it would make a lot of sense from a political and and cultural perspective to basically say, let's have, you know, let's let Burr take care of them. You know, we'll keep the Europeans out. You know, uh, Mexico is run by an American. It's practically, you know, an appendage of the United States, but, but it's not. And, you know, we get the best of both worlds. It's well managed by our ally, but we don't have to deal with the problems of it. And so I could definitely see a massive Mexican, you know, empire stretching from all the way from the southern tip of South America up up all the way to the Rio Grande. I mean, imagine that, and uh, and the kind of 
the effects of that 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 would have, assuming that it follows the path of Chile and and the more prosperous regions of Mexico ver- rather than say Venezuela, um, it would be a, it'd be a very successful country and would probably be a world a world economic power today. And if it continued to be allied with the United States, as I suspect it would have, uh, the United States would have been even more powerful on the global scale on the global uh, world. And, and Mexico uh, probably would have had uh, colonies in Africa. Imagine Mexican Congo. <laughs> Yeah, I guess this 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 is why you and I both enjoy you know what what the concept is behind a fork in time is when you start going down the what ifs uh, rabbit holes is not the word that I want to use because it's really it's, the, that sort of carries a negative connotation, but you start taking all these alternate forks in the road, all these alternate forks in time, and they lead you to some very interesting places. And the realization is that yeah, that seems strange. If I just threw that. The concept you just threw out today, the idea of Mexican Congo seems strange unless you listen to the last hour and a half of us talking about you know, how this progresses a little bit over time, all with plausible forks that you're taking. Yeah, you're well removed. Uh, you're several branches over now, but these are all, at the time that you look at them, logical branches that could have been taken. And uh, you know, we, we tend to forget. That's the other thing for me as a student of history. We tend to forget, uh, as you, I think you well pointed out, a lot of times history has this concept of almost an inertia that corrects itself back to what the path was a lot of times when we it, you know, we deviate off of it you would eventually sort of that path is a, is a detour but it comes back to what was the main flow of history if you will is the way that I think of it in my head but uh, but very often uh, what what we do find is that even those minor diversions have enough of an effect moving forward over time uh, that they're big enough to uh, to change you know major major events down the road and so while things are the same, what's different about them is, is real noticeable, I guess is the way that I would describe it. And uh, we, can, we can point to that, in, you know, small events just in, in our real history timeline that, you know, seemed insignificant at the time. But then you look at what their major impact is. You know, one of the ones that always amazes me is what happens if Alexander dies in one of his early, the early parts of, you know, his, 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 his expedition to conquer the world. Well, a lot of history gets changed if this guy named Alexander goes away. Early on, oh, and oh yeah, a huge amount of a huge amount of history, and so you know just in yeah, one one arrow, you know, one foot over <laughs> in a, you know, uh, now I guess almost twenty five hundred years ago, uh, it, you know, changes changes a lot uh, that we know there, and okay. so it, it all depends on when he dies too. I I in in thirty seconds, if he had died, let's say before the Battle of Issus. Well, I think it was after the battle of this is that uh, they offered him a deal. Uh, the Persians offered him a deal. But if he had been killed sometime during the Anatolian campaign, I suspect that his generals like Parmenio would have made a deal with uh, Persia. They would have received a tribute from Persia, an annual, some kind of annual tribute that Macedonia would have taken Asia Minor. And if they had conquered all the way to the Battle of Issus, they would have taken – basically, they would have stopped at wherever they were, and they would have agreed to take a tribute from Persia, and that would have been that. Would have been that. And and the, the real difference would have been how, how far would Hellenization have spread because right. Hellenization, Hellenization really only spread along the Mediterranean coastline. It never really penetrated significantly into Iraq, what modern-day Iraq or Iran. So – the differences may not have been as stark as we might think, but it just depends when Alexander died. If he, well, the most famous one was the Battle of uh, of uh, Carinae, uh, not Carinae, uh, um, the, uh, the Granicus at the River Granicus, where he was nearly killed by a Persian nobleman until his friend, uh, his one of his companion bodyguards, uh, Chrysus, uh, the the Persian nobleman was coming at Alexander from behind with his sword in hand, and then. Uh, Crisis came along and um, slashed the man's arm to the bone and severed it, actually, and saved. There's a famous painting of that, and he saved Alexander's life. That, I think, is probably the best question, uh, best time for Alexander to die because that would have had a real significant impact. Had he died, the expedition probably would have looted a few cities, you know, conquered a few cities along the coast of Asia Minor, and then would have made some deal with the, with the uh, Persians 
to leave it at that. Basically, the Greek the Greek areas of Persian Empire would have been ceded to Macedonia. They weren't very cooperative anyway, in exchange for some kind of a peace. Right. And and, and the, the other thing that I'll just we'll close out with here, because again we part of the reason for for exploring this topic in this month, as I mentioned, was sort of a referencing the fact that you know Lee has this obvious connection to Hamilton. Hamilton came up a number of times in your alternative narrative. Of course, comes up in the real history because of the connection between Burr, Burr being the cause of Hamilton's death and the duel. But you know, one of the one of the other interesting things to me that I was thinking about here is you know we see Hamilton here. I mean, we see Burr here working both behind the scenes, but then he's also in elective office. And you know, one of the little quirks of the American Constitution, American history, is that in order to be president. You needed to have been "quote unquote" native born, and so you know, we a lot of times I, I've even, especially since the popularity of the musical, when I've talked to people about you know, who Alexander Hamilton was, it's like, well, why was Hamilton never president? He could not be president <laughs> under the Constitution because he was actually born in the West Indies. He was not born uh, in the territory that would eventually become America, and the provision was that you had to be a native born American. And you know, well, you know, it, you know, that's an interesting question. Some some people say that. Some people said that, and uh, that if you were a citizen of the United States at the time of the Constitution, right. you were grandfathered in. It didn't matter where you were born, but but I think that, and that was probably legally the case. But I think what what held him back even more was just the natural inclination of Americans to favor people who had been here longer. You know, right. there's this modern day uh, uh, mythos that we've created the you know the myth that we've created and I, I don't say that in the negative context it's just it's an ahistorical hodgepodge we've created in the interest of national unity because we are so many different peoples living in one country now that we have to have this this national origin story but the national origin origin story of America as a nation of immigrants is fundamentally flawed in 1776 Englishmen had been living here on a permanent basis for nearly 200 years and when you look at the people who became the leaders of our republic, they were not newcomers by and large. There were notable exceptions that proved the rule, the most famous being Alexander Hamilton and Albert Gallatin. But Gallatin, who was very much respected for his economic acumen and leadership as Treasury Secretary, he was the most consequential Treasury Secretary we've had other than Hamilton from the period of Hamilton up until um, si uh, Salmon Chase during the Civil War, and from Chase – the next one would have probably been Andrew Mullen. So we've been the first hundred and some odd years. We really had four significant secretaries of the Treasury, one of which was Gallatin and the longest serving Treasury Secretary until Andrew Mullen in the eight, in the 1920s. But Gallatin never became president or vice president, even though he was nominated for vice president in 1824, largely because he was never seriously considered for the presidency because he was born in Switzerland. And because at the, even at that point, Americans – were pretty set in their ways, and they preferred someone who they considered to be to have deep roots in America. The Adams family, the Jefferson family, the Washington family, they had been in this country for 70, 100, 120 years before the, the revolution and the Constitution. So I think that helps, even though Hamilton could have run for president, and even though politically it politically would have been difficult for him, the reality is he always was carrying around that baggage of not having been born in the United States because people prefer people prefer people who they have a connection to, a longer connection to, and the longer the connection, the more likely they are to like you. So it's just one of those things, one of those other little forks in time that we have to be aware of. Right, right. Well, again, Brett, you don't have I, to like it, but it's true. It's, it's true, yeah. And, and again, you make an excellent point there. We we won't chase that down, but you know, we, we you use the term myth, and then you you clarify what you meant by that. We have our our and narratives. I think is a better way, a better term because it's more neutral in the sense of describing what is you know false versus real. But we have we have agreed shared narratives that we overlay because that helps us form a framework that we can understand this very confusing aspect of what history is, which is a, you know, a conglomeration of people and events that interact and bounce off each other. And it's helpful to overlay a template or a narrative on top of that that makes it understandable, 
because it simplifies it to some degree, but there's always the danger in the simplification of it, right? And so that's yeah. the that's the trade off that we have with you know our, our with our shared narratives. There's nothing wrong with our shared narratives, and generally speaking, they are true, except to the extent that you have to recognize when they're not. And that's actually what yeah. I think is the challenging part for any of us that are looking back in history, particularly the history that we didn't live, live through. I, I tell that I, I, I have an opportunity to teach in a, in a religious environment. I, I mention this all the time to the class that I teach there, but also in my, in my conversation is we always have to remember the lens that we're looking through and whether that lens is a valid lens or not, or at least recognize the fact that we're looking through the lens. There's nothing wrong with having the lens or the filter to understand things through because that's the way we process things as, as human beings. But we need to be cognizant of the filter that we have in place and what it may be obscuring or what it may be amplifying when we do it. Uh, for example, I talk all the time in the context of where I teach there each week is that it's impossible for us uh, to get into the full mindset mindset for example of a first century jew because we happen to be 20th century 21st century americans and we are always going to view things from this context that we have as 21st century americans and we need to recognize that nothing wrong with that or, or, or and we have global listeners as well so they, they give they bring their own lens to it uh but understand recognizing the fact that you're wearing the lens is important because the lens may be doing things of value for you but it also may be doing things that are that are obscuring or that are that are diminishing parts that are important parts of the story. And so, for example, you know, Lee, we'll, we'll close out of this because it sort of uh, circles things back with Burr. We look at Aaron Burr today through the lens of what actually happened in history. He shot Alexander Hamilton. He was accused of treason. Uh, he went into uh, essentially a self-imposed exile and never quite recovered back. So the Burr that we think of when we hear Aaron Burr is is the Aaron Burr that we know from history. It takes a while to take a step back and say, okay, let's imagine that's not his narrative, that one thing changes here in the case, and that's what A Fork in Time is all about. We would have, a, as you said, a very different impression of Burr. Burr may, may be on Mount Rushmore under one scenario, or in this case, the reason he's not on Mount Rushmore, he was actually a, fo a foreign emperor slash monarch, and we don't put that on Mount Rushmore, right, <laughs> even, though, even though he was an influential president. It, a small thing would have made a huge difference potentially. But we're blinded to some degree by what we know happened that it's sometimes hard for us to to think about the what if in a very different way or or view his character in a very different way you know he's viewed as being you know sort of ambitious and amoral well he 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 was he was ambitious there's no doubt about that, but was he amoral? I don't know we only have that concept of him because of what actually happened uh, or a lot of historians have that concept where in reality you know, he was just the loser and came out on the different end of the real history. Yes, yes. If not for a certain fork in time in history, Aaron Burr could well have been remembered as the American Bismarck, the American Disraeli, uh, probably not the American Gladstone. That been, that would have been more Martin Van Buren or Thomas Jefferson. But uh, if not for that change in history, he could have well been remembered uh, in a very different and far more positive light. And uh, I'll I'll. I'll recommend everyone, just to close, I'll recommend everyone read the book uh, Burr by Gore Vidal. It's a historical novel about the life of Aaron Burr told through a young man who interviews him. There's uh, some great stories in there, and you get a really good uh, impression of how Burr viewed the world and the people he interacted with. And he lived so long. He lived from 1850, uh, 1755 to 1836. He lived for 81 years. And interacted. Basically, his life parallels the first seven, almost 70 years of the American Republic. And he was intimate acquaintances and one time allies with every American president, uh, except for John Quincy Adams, um, up until Martin Van Buren. From Washington to Van Buren, every president except John Quincy Adams. He, Burr had a fairly significant connection to or relationship with, in the case of John Adams, adversarial, and Washington, adversarial, or in the case of the others, an ally with. In fact, some people think, although it's never been, there's no hard evidence other than various rumors, conjecture, and circumstantial evidence, that Aaron Burr is actually, was actually the father of President Martin Van Buren. That, so you he took a very interesting uh, he took a very interesting uh, 
interest in the career of this young state legislator, Burr did in his old days in New York City as a retired politician and lawyer and man about town. Uh, he had a significant uh, connection and interest in Martin Van Buren, which might have just been because they were both politicians opposed to the same people and men on the make. And Burr recognized a young man you know, on the make, to, out to make his success in politics, or it might have been another, uh, it might have been another reason, and we'll never know, but I highly recommend you read Gore Vidal's novel uh, about Burr. You, it will well, it will be well worth your time. Uh, Vidal is a great writer of his historical fiction, and it will, uh, you will enjoy it very much. And I'll close with this quote from one of the greatest Westerns ever made, but greatest Western slash political movie ever made, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance with John Wayne and James Stewart. As we talk about the national narrative, the national legends and history and fact and myth, the great closing line from that movie, this is the West, sir. And when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. <laughs> right. Uh, for all kinds of reasons, if for no other reason, then it's just more interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you made the recommendation on on, on uh, Vidal's no novel because I was also going to make a recommendation recommendation as well, which I think also speaks well to the concept here. My familiarity with most of Burr's uh, uh, narrative, his biographical narrative, actually comes from a, a book called Fallen, Fa Colin, Fallen Father. And when you understand the title, there's the idea that, that Burr is a, is a founding father to a degree. It's just that the way that we look back on him now because of the real timeline is he's, he's fallen from grace because of the things that happened. But again, again, as we've already talked about here and have illuminated, illuminated well, so we don't need to dwell on it, is that uh, he's a, he, he deserves to be in that conversation in the same way that we talk about a Hamilton or a Jefferson or any of the other influential, uh, those that participated in the Revolutionary War or had a role in, in the founding of the nation, either as part of the formation of the Constitution or in the early electoral history. I mean, for goodness sakes, Burr was, vice, was, the, uh, was the Vice President of the United States. And so, but yet we, the, the title of that book, I think, says a lot just in the title. He's looked at as being the fallen father now, having fallen from grace. And so I would recommend that if you if you want a, uh, a historical perspective on it as well. Brant, again, appreciate you joining us today. I'm happy to have you to be part of the Fork in Time community and having found us and now having this uh, second step as a as a co-host here on the, on the, on the podcast. And so we'll look forward to having you back at another time. We may do something that's not a political electoral event, because I know you have other areas of interest there as well, but I know uh, you're my go-to person right now when I want to talk about these types of subjects, because I know you have a passion for it, I know you have an understanding of it, and again, as you've laid out in your uh, in your outline today, uh, a firm understanding about how to write the alternate timeline as well. So again, thank you, and uh, appreciate you being part of us here as we, as we kick off uh, this little exploration into some Hamilton-related things here in January. We invite you to visit our website, that's it www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Again, you can learn more about the podcast there, about ways of participating in terms of suggesting topics, also participating in terms of if you're interested and have the ability to do so, providing support for the podcast with a link there to our Patreon page. But most importantly, again, we thank you for your time today. Let folks know about the podcast if you're new to it, if you're a long-term listener. Uh, we continue to appreciate your patronage and look forward to seeing you next time on the podcast. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Join us next time.